Tonight, row continues. Canadian police accuse India of working with a criminal network. Election season. Campaigning begins for Japan's parliamentary election or a thousand candidates to contest. Middle East bloom. Israel carries out airstrikes on southern Lebanon for the first time in five days. And special feature. Seattle Kid climbs to the top of a tall pine tree, giving a spectacular item for the gathered crowds. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Other Than Anna World News Tonight. Very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight where we bring you the latest updates across the globe and we begin today with the ongoing row between India and Canada. Canadian police made a sensational claim that the agents of the Indian government were using organized crime groups like the Bishnoi group to target leaders of the pro-Khalistan movement which calls for a separate Sikh homeland in India. This was hours after the both countries expelled top diplomats as tensions escalated over last year's assassination of a Sikh separatist on Canadian soil. Data dismiss all the allegations as preposterous, accusing Prime Minister Justin Trudeau of catering to Canada's seizable Sikh community for political gain. The Canadian police were referring to Lawrence Bishnoi, a 31-year-old gangster from India, now back in the spotlight domestically and internationally. Indian police say his gang is allegedly linked to the killing of the prominent politician in Mumbai at the weekend, which gunman shot dead a 66-year-old Baba Siddiq near his son's office. Three suspects are in custody and alleged aide of Bishnoi has posted on social media that the gang is behind the murder. Once among India's most wanted, Bishnoi has been in prison since 2015, now held far from his native Punjab state in Gujarat. Yet the police believe his audacious influence endures. Bishnoi is the prime accused in the sensational murder of Sidhu Muswala, the popular Punjabi singer gunned down near his village in October in the year 2022. In 2018, Bishnoi gained notoriety for threatening Bollywood star Salman Khan, accusing him of allegedly poaching two black buck antelopes, a revered species of Rajasthan's Bishnoi community to which Lawrence belongs. When he was produced in a court in Jodhpur city, he openly told the waiting media, Salman Khan will be killed here in Jodhpur. Then he will come to know about our real identity. Incidentally, Siddiq, the murdered politician, was a close friend of the Bollywood star. In March last year, news channel aired two interviews with Bishnoi from the inside a Punjab jail, prompting an outraged high court to order an investigation. How a high security inmate managed phone interviews from prison remains a mystery. Federal investigations estimated Bishnoi continues to control a gang with 700 members across Punjab, Haryana, Rajasthan and Delhi, involved in extorting celebrities, smuggling drugs and weapons and carrying out targeted assassinations. The police say this partner Goldibra, also a co-accused in the Moosewala killing, runs the gang by remote control from Canada. Bishnoi faces more more than 30 cases, with 19 currently being tried in court. With Pakistan hosting this year's two-day Shanghai Cooperation Organization Summit, leaders of the 10 member states gathered in the country's capital, Islamabad. Top lib diplomats were seen arriving ahead of Wednesday's main conference with the likes of Chinese Premier Li Xiang and the Indian Foreign Minister Subramaniam Jai Shankar on a rare visit to the host country. Pakistan's capital has been under a strict security lockdown since Monday, with this government announcing a public holiday in Islamabad, temporarily shutting down schools and businesses, while large contingents of paramilitary and police forces were deployed across the city. While most heads of state declined the invitation to attend the Pakistan summit, the arrival of India's foreign minister marked the first visit by the rival country's top envoy in almost a decade. Now, Li Chang's visit is also the first by a Chinese premier to Pakistan in 11 years. The SEO, a Eurasian security organization created by China and Russia in 2001, is comprised of 10 member states, China, Russia, India, Pakistan, Iran, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan and Belarus, the last of which officially joined the pact in July. It is officially election season in Japan. More than a thousand candidates are kicking off their campaigns to win seats in the lower house. Now, for more details on the Japanese general elections, we have other there in a world new special correspondent, Rasita Chandradasa from Tokyo, Japan. What's the situation, Rasita? Hi. It's a nice, nice autumn day in Tokyo today, but it's the election night, election fever that the people are talking mostly. 
As you all know, the Japanese parliament was dissolved officially yesterday and the next election will be on 27th October. So that means this will be a very short election span, like 12 days, probably the shortest in the modern history. And the government is keen, uh, they were keen to have this election very soon given the issues they were having. And the, the Prime Minister Ishiba-san thought the more we wait is going to be a more problem for them. So he called for a snap election. So this election in the Japanese parliament for the power uh, is a very interesting one as well because Japan has a hybrid uh, election system where first past the post system elect 279 representatives and there's another 176 elected by the representative depends on the votes uh, given given to the parties. So overall there are 465 seats in the Japanese parliament we call diet and the winners must take the 433. So the, let's look at the two main players the government LDP and their coalition partner New Kometo and they actually have a super majority now but many pundits believe getting the majority even for the combined coalition might not be easy this time and some opinion polls were giving the LDP less than 200 seats and a combined tally of less than 230 for the coalition. Look at the CDP, the main constitutional democratic party which already elected the new leader Noda Yoshihiko even though they are doing well, but still not, not many people be, give them a, a chance to achieve the majority of 233 seats. So most believe that the next parliament would be a hand parliament where no one will have a superpower and those regional parties will have a big sway in the decision making. Over to you. Thank you. That was Adha Derana World News Special Correspondent Rasita Chandradasa from Tokyo, Japan. Let's take a short commercial break now. More world news on the other side. On the road to the White House now, Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump defended his protectionist trade policies and other physical proposals, dismissing suggestions that they could drive up the federal debt, antagonize allies and harm the U.S. economy. Donald Trump says he isn't about to change course on economic policies, including a pledge to hit many imports with big tariffs. It's going to have a massive effect, positive effect. The Republican presidential candidate was grilled Tuesday night in Chicago by Bloomberg editor-in-chief John Micklethwaite. And it was a more combative encounter than interviews Trump has done with friendlier outlets like Fox News. Trump went on to say tariff was the most beautiful word in the dictionary. He said his plans to levy them would bring jobs back to the U.S. and raise enough money to keep public debts under control. The protectionist policy has been condemned by many economists who argue it would actually cut jobs, drive up prices, and alienate key allies. But Trump says countries like Mexico and Germany, both of which he has threatened with tariffs, have a simple remedy available. Trump did appear to back away from previous suggestions he should control the Federal Reserve. But he said he should have the right to say whether rates should go up or down. And he didn't answer when asked if he would reappoint current Fed Chair Jerome Powell. Still in the U.S., a Santa Monica College employee was shot and injured at a satellite campus in California. Authorities are searching for the suspect. The victim is in critical condition and classes have been cancelled for 30,000 students. Tonight, authorities in California searching for a man suspected of shooting a co-worker at Santa Monica College Monday night, finding the suspect dead in a vehicle miles from the crime scene. Let's go. The victim rushed to the hospital in critical condition around 10 p.m. Monday night outside Santa Monica College's Center for Media and Design, one of the school's satellite campuses. About 30,000 students attend the school full or part-time. Authorities closing down all seven campuses and canceling classes as they searched for the suspect. Santa Monica College was rocked by a horrific mass shooting back in 2013. 23-year-old John Zahari, seen here entering the school's library before opening fire on students and staff, part of a multi-scene spree that ended with six dead, including the suspect. 
Updating you now on the ongoing crisis in the Middle East, Israeli jets struck the southern suburbs of Beirut for the first time in six days. The casualty count was reported to be higher than 10. The Israeli army said its forces hit dozens of Hezbollah targets in the Lebanese city of Nabate. The army said in a statement that the IDF army struck dozens of Hezbollah terrorist targets in the Nabate and area dismantled underground infrastructure used by Hezbollah's Rathbun forces in southern Lebanon. Lebanese Prime Minister Najib Mikati condemned the deadly Israel strikes today, saying the Israeli army intentionally targeted a municipality meeting. Lebanon's health ministry said five people were killed in the strike. Israeli tanks have targeted a home in the Sabra area of the South Gaza city with two artillery shells, according to the Civil Defense Agency. No injuries have been reported so far. The Israeli army launched a ground assault again in the northern Gaza 12 days ago. Backed by warplanes, the army has continued to pound the ravaged area that has seen multiple attacks throughout the year-long war. More than 400,000 Palestinians remain trapped in the area, unable to move southwards because of the deadly ground incursion. The strikes this morning came shortly after Netanyahu rejected the idea of a ceasefire that would leave Hezbollah close to the northern Israeli border. He told the French President Emmanuel Macron that he was opposed to a unilateral ceasefire which does not change the security situation in Lebanon and which would return the country to its previous state, according to a readout from his office. Also in a televised address, Hezbollah's deputy leader Naim Qasim said the only solution to the recent escalations was a ceasefire while also threatening to continue targeting Israel with missiles. The US has written to Israel giving it 30 days to boost humanitarian aid access in Gaza or risk having some US military assistance cut off. The letter amounts to the strongest known written warning from the US to its ally and comes amid a new Israeli offensive in northern Gaza. Emergency services in Jabalia, overwhelmed by civilian casualties. In northern Gaza, nowhere is safe from Israeli airstrikes. Not even the school where this heavily pregnant woman was taking shelter. An increasingly desperate situation that has pushed the United States to give its ally Israel perhaps its strongest warning yet. The letter, signed by the U.S. Secretary of State and Defense Secretary, has given Israel an ultimatum radically increase humanitarian access in Gaza within 30 days, or face having some military assistance from Washington cut off. It comes as the United Nations and aid groups raise the alarm over their struggle to deliver assistance in northern Gaza, which has been the target of the Israeli army's latest offensive in the enclave for more than a week now. Israel says it's rooting out Hamas fighters who have regrouped in the north, but it's also home to some 400,000 people, locked in a struggle for survival amid dwindling supplies of food and medical aid. The first food supplies in more than two weeks were allowed into northern Gaza on Monday, though humanitarian workers say the city of Jabalia, which is also home to a vast refugee camp, remains impossible to reach. Chinese and Russian defense officials vowed to strengthen their cooperation during meetings in Beijing this week. In the latest sign of deepening alignment between the neighbors that's been closely watched by the U.S. and its allies. For more news on the story, we have Adderna World News Special Correspondent Minoli Zagaria from Kursk, Russia. Over to you, Minoli. Yes. The two countries have common views, a common assessment of the situation and a common understanding of what they need to do together. Their task is to strengthen and develop their strategic partnership. The Russian defense chief Andrei Belousov's visit has been cited as the first to China since his appointment in May and comes days ahead of an expected visit by Chinese leader Xi Jinping to Russia. Russia and China have been bolstering their security coordination in the face of shared frictions with the West. That's included ramping up joint military deals in recent months, part of what expects, experts say in an effort to signal to Washington that while the two are not allies, neither stand alone. During Tuesday's meeting, Zhang repeated rhetoric voice by Xi and Russian President Vladimir Putin calling for the two militaries to deepen and expand military-to-military -military relations, safeguard their respective national sovereignty, security and development interests, and jointly safeguard international and regional peace and stability. Now, this is according to a readout from Chinese Defense Ministry. Belosov also had talks a day earlier with Chinese Defense Minister Dong Zhang, who ranks below Zhang in China's military hierarchy. The Russian defense chief strip 
comes ahead of an expected visit by Chinese leader Xi Jinping to Kazan, Russia next week for a summit of BRICS, an economic grouping Moscow and Beijing see as their answer to the US-backed G7. China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs has not confirmed Xi's travel plans, but the Kremlin last month quoted Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi as confirming the leader's attendance. The trip would be Xi's second to Russia since Putin's February 2022 invasion of Ukraine and the fifth face-to-face -face with Putin in the same period. Regular high-level diplomacy and increased security coordination between China and Russia have come under close security from the US and its allies, who have accused the provision of dual-use goods like machine tools and microelectronics. Beijing has defended what it calls as a normal trade with Russia and claims neutrality in the conflict. The two countries reached record levels of trade last year as China emerged as a key economic lifeline for Russia, which is trapped by war-related international sanctions. In recent weeks, Chinese and Russian coast guards conducted what Beijing described as their first joint patrol in the Arctic Ocean while their navies separately practiced anti-submarine warfare in the northern West Pacific Ocean. The patrol followed a raft of joint exercises over the summer, including near Alaska, where US and Canadian forces intercepted Russian and Chinese bombers together for the first time and in the South China Sea. A vital waterway claimed almost entirely by Beijing in which geopolitical tension are rapidly arising. Belosov's arrival in Beijing coincided with China's military flying a record number of fighters jet and other warplanes around Taiwan during large-scale military drills. China said the drills were intended as a stern warning to what is described as pre-independence forces in Taiwan. The drills came days after the island's new president, Lai Cheng Ti, gave a speech vowing to protect Taiwan's sovereignty in the face of challenges from Beijing, which claimed the self-ruling democracy as its own. Back to you. Thank you. That was Adder Derner World News Special Correspondent Minoli Zagaria from Kursk, Russia. Sydney Metro services will not run for the upcoming weekend with track work taking place and buses replacing services. One day a year, the population of Crow's Nest booms tenfold. Streets shut down, food trucks and bands take over. 50,000 people expected to come from all over Sydney this Sunday, but they won't be able to catch the Metro. Crow's Nest Fest, a local institution spanning over 30 years, organised by volunteers who first lodged plans in January. The new Metro was said to be the centrepiece of the celebration. Extra streets closed around it and plans scaled up and anticipating a record crowd arriving through here. Tech giant Google is the latest company to seek nuclear energy to cope with the high demand of electricity propelled by its development of AI. Google announced an agreement with California-based Kairos Power to bring small molecular reactors online by 2030 with the additional reactor deployments to 2035. No financial details of the deal have been made available and it is still unclear whether Google wants to co-finance the construction of the power plants or just purchase electricity after completion. Google's Senior Director of Energy and Climate said during a briefing that they believe that nuclear energy has a critical role to play in supporting their clean growth and helping to deliver on the progress of AI and the grid needs these kinds of clean, reliable sources of energy that can support the build out of these technologies. Other companies like Microsoft have already bet on nuclear energy. Three Mile Island, the site of America's worst nuclear accident, is expected to restart operations to provide energy to Microsoft. Kairos Power said that the SMRs that it will provide for Google are cooled with molten fluoride sores instead of water. The company said that this design is deemed safer than conventional reactors because the coolant does not boil. Nuclear power, which is virtually carbon-free and provides electricity 24 hours a day, has become increasingly attractive to the tech industry as it attempts to cut emissions even as it uses more energy. Global energy consumption by data centers is expected to more than double by the end of the decade, according to a Wall Street banking giant Goldman Sachs. John Moore, industry editor of the Tech Target website, said that the AI data centers need large amounts of electricity to both power them and keep the equipment cool. At a United Nations climate change conference last year, the US joined a group of countries that want to triple their nuclear energy capacity by the year 2050 as a part of efforts to move away from fossil fuels. However, critics say nuclear power is not risk-free and produces long-lasting radioactive waste. 
Although SMRs are seen as a pioneering new technology backed by big investors such as Microsoft founder Bill Gates, the technology is nascent and lacks regulatory approval. Let's take a short commercial break now. More about news on the other side. <laughs> Welcome back. And finally tonight, a spectacle for the park goers who couldn't believe their eyes when they saw a little kid on the top of a tall pine tree. They were all set for a movie night at a neighborhood park in Seattle. Dozens of families had gathered to watch Shrek, but it turned out to be a double feature starring the little kid. Look closely. What's that at the very top of that tree? That's no bird. It's a kid. Just look at him hanging out at the tippy top like a little Tarzan. People in the park couldn't believe what they were seeing. They were all set for movie night at a neighborhood park in Seattle. Dozens of families had gathered to watch Shrek. Take a look at me. But it turned out to be a double feature starring little Tarzan. She says he came down all on his own and continued playing like nothing had ever happened. And that brings us to the end of today's bulletin. We will see you again tomorrow with the latest happenings across the globe. Stay tuned as we've got Sunny Vimuda Naika joining you next on the Naika Business Report. Thank you for watching and have a good night.